Hello there! Welcome to Scan and Keep Productions. I'm Crime Graves Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video we're asking a question of what if Napoleon never invaded Russia? So, as we always do with the videos, we always give a bit of context first and then we're going to, at a later point, dive into the alternative history, right? So, first of all, Napoleon, he rose to power as a result of the French Revolution. So the French Revolution, obviously, you know, the, uh, the French people overthrew their, uh, their king and then uh, they, you know, they were involved in a series of wars because all the other uh, nations of Europe basically ganged up against France because they didn't want revolutionary Republican governments to kind of spring up in their own countries. However, during this time, obviously, you had the uh, elimination of like, the, uh, the very entrenched class system which you had in France, and this allowed Napoleon Bonaparte to rise up through the ranks. So I'm not going to give it a long history about like Napoleon you know, and like his, his life story and stuff, right? But all you need to know is that, you know, as we said, he rose through the ranks and he eventually ended up crowning himself emperor in 1804. So in 1805, Napoleon tried to invade England because out of all the different uh, enemies that France had, uh, England had always been like the, the strongest against them, right? And, you know, this basically ended up failing because of the Battle of Trafalgar, in which the British fleet ended up destroying the French and Spanish fleet, and this basically completely destroyed the uh, French navy. So Napoleon was no longer able to invade Britain. So what he ended up doing instead was setting up what's known as the continental system. So the continental system is basically France and its allies, you know, basically being banned from trading with Britain at all. So this was not very popular in many parts of uh, the continent, especially amongst France's so-called allies, because realistically, France didn't really have allies. It kind of just had defeated these countries in war and basically, you know, installed either puppet regimes like, you know, people within Napoleon's family and put them on the throne of different countries, or they just had kind of been made to kowtow, yeah, because of like being defeated in battle. So, yeah, the rulers of these places were in for most parts like very reluctant to like, actually go along with this. And on top of that, you know, the people of the countries were not very happy with it as well. So this led to a great deal of smuggling, etc, etc. However, in 1810, Russia ended up withdrawing from the continental system. Now, the reason for this is because, uh, you know, twofold. Yeah. One, because uh, you know, Russia's uh, exports end up being reduced by about 40% during this time. Uh, you know, because Russia at that time traded a lot with England, yeah. Uh, and then on top of that, this led to an increase of debts and it led to inflation. So that was the first reason as to why Russia uh, withdrew from it. The second reason was because uh, France had basically uh, allowed uh, West Galicia to join with uh, the, the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. So the Grand Duchy of Warsaw is basically uh, a French puppet state, which is basically within Poland. And this was as a result of Poland being divided up between uh, uh, Russia, Prussia and Austria in 1795. So Poland wouldn't exist as a country and you know, from 1795 up until 1918. So by Napoleon giving uh, the Grand Duchy of Warsaw this extra territory in Western Galicia, right, which he had taken from the Austrians, this ended up greatly expanding uh, the border between Russia and a French ally. So these two things combined, yeah, one, uh, Russia you know, being affected by uh, the continental system, and two, this greater expansion on its border of basically a hostile uh, neighbour, this greatly you know, threatened uh, uh, Tsar Alexander I. So in response to this, Napoleon got very angry and he decided, right, that's it. I'm going to teach the Russians a lesson. Yeah, and he sent a very a strongly worded uh, letter uh, of you know, declaration of war to the Russians. And at this point, he uh, assembled a massive army of about 422,000 men. Right. And this was mainly uh, French people uh, from like the, the, the so-called Grand Army uh, and then also uh, a few uh, French allies and stuff. Right. And the idea was that they were going to go straight to, uh, to Russia. They're going to uh, seize Moscow. They're going to you know, basically uh, completely humiliate and destroy the Russians. And that would teach them a lesson for breaking uh, the blockade against the British. Now, Russia in this time, you know, it was a growing power in Europe, but it still wasn't like where it would be uh, le you know, later on within uh, the century, right? So it was still very uh, backward, it was still very feudal, and its army, while it was large, it wasn't uh, uh, you know, as organised as some of the other armies uh, on the continent would be, basically. So 
Russia at this point wasn't really at the same level as a lot of uh, you know, the, the different uh, armies within Europe, right? And on top of that, Napoleon had defeated the Russians in several different of these uh, wars. Because what we have to understand is that the Napoleonic Wars wasn't just one big war, right? It was a series of different conflicts involving different coalitions uh, against the French. And yeah, so, you know, they'd really been defeated before. And Napoleon kind of was like, right, we'll be able to defeat them again. However, the Grand Armée was used to fighting in Europe, right? And within Europe, you know, you have uh, places which are densely populated, you have, you know, uh, fields and stuff which are very fertile, and you also have, like, a good, like, road network here yeah, between the different towns and, and cities and stuff, right? So it makes, like, marching, like, between one place and another very easy, uh, and this is kind of what led to a lot of Napoleon's victories because he was able to outflank and surprise his enemies by how quickly his army was able to manoeuvre and, like, to get to where they needed to be. However, Russia was, a, you know, was completely different to this, right? Russia, you know, is very sparsely populated. It had, you know, you go for miles and miles in Russia with just, like, fields and fields and fields, very few towns, very few cities, and very small populations in both. And on top of that, the road system was just meh, okay? And, you know, so when Napoleon invaded, yeah, on the 24th of June, 1812, yeah, which is two days after Barbarossa, right? So uh, Barbarossa, which uh, was the invasion of the Soviet Union in uh, 1941, that took place on the 22nd of June, right? So, you know, Napoleon and Hitler both invaded Russia roughly the same time of year, right? And there was lots of parallels between that invasion and, uh, you know, the, the later invasion. Uh, and, you know, one of the main things is that, you know, during the, uh, the summer months in Russia, it's ridiculously hot, right? So these troops are marching for miles and miles and miles in extreme heat. And on top of that, you then have you know, a, a lot of rain and this ends up mixing with the very poor roads that they have there and you're having basically uh, mudslides and stuff. You know, you basically, the whole countryside ends up being like rivers of mud. And this in Russian is known as the Rasputitsa. I think I pronounced that correctly. And yeah, so the Rasputitsa, this is basically when it's the roads are pretty much impassable. You know, this even slowed down uh, the Germans in 1941. You know, so they had tanks and stuff, yeah, and even that helped to basically slow down uh, the German advance there. On top of that, you know, a few centuries before, it slowed down the Mongols, and this is why the, the city of Novgorod was never conquered by the Mongols, because you know, whether it's modern uh, you know, military or whether it's like cavalry and stuff, those roads are impassable. And actually something along the lines of about like a thousand horses per day were lost by the French army in this summer campaign. And you know, many, many hundreds of thousands of, 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 of Frenchmen end up dying along the way as well, right? So this is what we'll kind of get onto a little bit later in the video, yeah? When we kind of focus on like, uh, you know, what ends up being the casualties, a lot of the focus is put on the winter campaign, but and not enough was put on the summer, right? So on the way there, you know, there's 422,000 uh, uh, Frenchmen who end up uh, setting off for, for Russia. And over the next few months, these numbers severely dwindle, and we'll get onto those figures a little bit later. So by August of 1812, yeah, you had uh, the famous uh, Battle of Smolensk, uh, and, and, you know, and this battle was very decisive, and it's included in Tolstoy's uh, War and Peace, so definitely you know, uh, t see the TV series that the BBC did a few years ago, that was like really, really good. Uh, also as well, obviously just read the book or just watch some other film on it, it was really, really good, and it helped you to understand a lot of like the history of this, especially from a Russian perspective. Uh, but yeah, so you had the, the Battle of Smolensk, and then after that, you had the Battle of Borodino. Because up until this point, the Russian uh, strategy was basically one of scorched earth and retreat, right? So, you know, what you do is you basically, you know, burn all the, the, the crops, you burn the villages, etc., cetera, et cetera. You basically make it so that the French armies, which are used to being able to go around places and forage for food and like, like steal from the locals and stuff, yeah, you basically strip them of any ability to get food and of shelter. And then it becomes very difficult for them, you know, as Napoleon said, like, you know, uh, an army marched on its stomach. And so if you basically starve the stomach, then the army kind of grinds to a halt. And Borodino, although on paper it was a French victory, it was actually quite a Peric victory, which means that it was a victory that comes at a great cost, because a third of the, 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 you know, of the fighting force of the French was lost at this one battle, right? And, you know, it, this on the way to Moscow. So although they end up winning this battle, and then seven days later they end up taking Moscow, by the time they get to Moscow, 
Moscow is a, a blaze, right? You know, they, they set fire even to, to Moscow, which at the time was not the capital, but historically had been like the, the cultural uh, like center point of Russia, right? You know, so the French end up getting there. There's nothing in the city. It's all just a blaze. And they end up being held up there for five weeks, right? And at this point, the Russian winter starts to set in. And it's clear at this point that Napoleon is not going to be able to just capture like, the, uh, the Russian military because they're going to be able to just keep retreating, keep retreating. So at this point, Napoleon has to make a decision. We're in Moscow, we're in like, the ruins of Moscow. Uh, there's no shelter, there's no food, and you know, you know, winter is coming, right? Um, so at this point, he decides to retreat. And early on in uh, November, he ends up getting a uh, word that there's going to be a coup potentially uh, in Paris, right? So, you know, he leaves his men, he gets on a sleigh and he like goes straight back to Paris and his men, what's left of the army, has to, you know, march slowly back to uh, the Russian border, right? And during this time, you have uh, the Cossacks. Uh, so the Cossacks are basically uh, cavalrymen uh, in Russia. They're very uh, uh, irregular forces and stuff, yeah. And they're used to, like, basically following uh, armies and then striking at the opportune moment, you know, uh, with, like, sabres and stuff, they you know, attack them, and then they retreat back into the forest, right? So all the way back, they keep getting attacked. Also, as well, you have uh, local Russians who are uh, partisans, and they were attacking them. So much the same way you see with the Germans, like, uh, during, like, uh, uh, Operation Barbarossa, they keep being held back uh, by, uh, uh, you know, uh, the local Russians and stuff, right? And bit by bit, the army ends up just getting worn down and worn down and worn down. And it's not until the 14th of December that the French are finally able to uh, get across, right? So as we said before, right, they went in with this force of 422,000 men. Only 100,000 of them actually reached Moscow. And by the time they end up uh, retreating back across the Russian border, something like only 10,000 of them end up surviving. Now, obviously the figures for this end up, you know, depend on what source you read. Like people weren't very uh, great at keeping records in those days. So like depending on what historian you look at, there's different things, but for, you know, for the order of, uh, in order of to keep some of consistency, we're sticking with one data set here, right? Yeah, you know, so this is an absolutely crushing defeat, right? You know, the casualty rate for this is something like 95%, right? And it's just, you know, so the Grand Armée is pretty much no more, right? So with this alternative history, we're basically going to be like, right, what if Napoleon had just kind of, you know, held together, you know, restrained himself and been like, right, I'm not going to invade Russia. How would history and, you know, the history of France, the history of Europe, how would the history of Russia have been different if this hadn't have happened. That's what we're gonna look into now. Well, first off, one of the things we can almost guarantee wouldn't have happened is, you know, the War of the Sixth Coalition. So this is basically, you know, as we said before, there's different coalitions that of like armies that come together uh, to fight the French. So the Sixth Coalition, more likely than not, wouldn't have happened, right? Because this ended happening in 1813. So with the Grand Armée completely like, uh, you know, obliterated, yeah. So, you know, the term like uh, decimate means to reduce a force by 10, yeah. So we would go, oh, now it was decimated, yeah. You know, this was far more than 10%. This is almost 95% casualty rate, right? It's, it's utterly wiped out, right? So Prussia and Austria, they kind of go, right, okay, we're kind of at the moment being held under control by like the, the French. However, their army's just been destroyed. Now is the time for us to rise up and for us to, to kick the French out and stuff, right? So, you know, the Prussians, the Austrians, you know, they end up aligning themselves with the Russians, the Swedes, uh, the Portuguese, and of course the British, yeah, who, you know, the British are involved in every single coalition, as well as Portugal, uh, who is the longest standing uh, uh, um, ally of England, going all the way back to like uh, 700 years ago or something like that, right to the founding of Portugal, England was instrumental in that, right? So from all sides, you know, in this uh, war of like the, the Sixth Coalition, this is when France is finally crushed, Napoleon is defeated, and he's sent into exile to like the, the island of Elba, right? Now, you know, what ends up happening later is, you know, he ends up coming back, you know, there's the War of 100 Days, and then this culminates in like the Battle of Waterloo, and at the end of the day, he kind of is kind of doing like an encore, but the thing is, he's already kind of been defeated, yeah? So, People often kind of with all these alternative uh, history scenarios go, oh, what if he'd won at Waterloo? No, the fact he was destroyed in Russia, this was kind of the uh, turning point, right? This was the pivotal moment because the fact he was destroyed here, that was what crushed a large swathe of his army. And without that force, without that grand army, 
it meant that all of his future campaigns from that point on were kind of doomed, right? You know, hands down, it was the worst decision that Napoleon ever made, right? Because if he hadn't of invaded Russia, more likely than not, he would have been able to hold on to continental Europe far longer, you know, for however long, right? And that's kind of what we're debating here. So one of the things to kind of take into consideration is this, right? You have, you know, Napoleon, he dies in 1821, right? Now, different historians have uh, debated about this. Some people say, you know, he was uh, poisoned. Some people say he just died of natural causes anyway. Um, so when he was uh, exiled the second time, they didn't just send him to the Mediterranean uh, on the island of Alba. They sent him to the South Atlantic, which is, uh, you know, the British colony of St. Helena. And this is where he spent the last six years of his life. Now, as far as I'm aware, medical uh, historians now uh, they have looked into it and it seems that he had uh, cancer. Uh, uh, you know, apparently throughout the course of his life, he had a lot of uh, uh, you know, stomach problems and stuff. Uh, so more likely than not, he would have just died of uh, cancer anyway. So let's kind of run with that just for argument's sake here, that he dies in 1821. Well, his son at that point, yeah, Napoleon II, was only 10 years old. And Napoleon II, you know, he lives to be the right old age of 21, right? So he dies in 1832. So Napoleon is holding together this loose coalition of all these different competing uh, 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 countries within Europe who don't really want to be controlled by France. And, you know, they're only held together by France because of, like, the brilliance of, like, of, like Napoleon and, like, his, the strength of his army, right? So you hand that over to a 10 year old, right? And that 10 year old lives for another 11 years. So basically a teenager is running one of the largest empires like, you know, that Europe's ever seen, right? This is probably not the wisest thing. And so the alternative to Napoleon II running things is that Napoleon's younger brother, Joseph Bonaparte, he ends up running it. So Napoleon in our own timeline uh, made him like the, the kind of puppet king of like of uh, Spain. Uh, so it might have been a thing where he might have just taken over after Napoleon. Uh, he ended up living for another like few years. Yeah. So he died in 1844. So maybe this whole show keeps running for a bit longer and then you know we're in our own timeline uh napoleon the third who discussed in other videos uh he ends up coming to the throne in france in uh 1848 so you know maybe things kind of run along for the for the bonapartes for a few more decades but to what extent would they have been able to hold uh, their uh, possessions in the continent right well, first of all, England, more likely than not, would have survived, okay? So England during this time, although you had this continental system, even Napoleon himself ended up admitting that it did more harm to France and to, to, and to her allies than it did to England itself. Because England, obviously being out on like the high seas, was able to trade a lot with like the rest of the world, right? So exports to the continent uh, for Britain went down from 55% to about 25%. And you saw a similar thing in World War II as well, yeah, with like the Nazis, yeah, right? So, you know, Britain was still able to, uh, to, to trade a little bit with the continent, but our exports went down from 55% down to 25%. So, you know, in the context of Brexit, for instance, when we were talking about it, we were talking about maybe, I don't know, 55% down to, at worst case, what, 40%? So it's a thing where Britain can kind of survive this thing, although it did lead to a large degree of unemployment and to inflation, uh, plus obviously all the wars that Britain was fighting against Napoleon because they were involved in every single coalition, right? Uh, you know, our national debt ended up ballooning to like 250% of GDP, so it's the largest it's ever been, right? So Britain would have survived, but it would have, you know, it would have been very costly for us. Well, there's something to note that, you know, the War of 1812, which we, you know, we had the war with the, the Americans and stuff, yeah, that had a bigger impact on our uh, overall, like, trade and stuff, yeah, than did, like, the, the, the thing with France, yeah. So between 1810 and 1812, this is when we had, you know, a lot of, like, difficulty with regard to mass unemployment. Because of, of the building tensions with the Americans, uh, that's kind of, that had more of an impact, really. So now that we looked at the effect that the continental system had on Britain, what would the effect of its continuation have been on uh, Europe itself? Well, something to note, of course, is that, you know, British goods tend to be a lot cheaper uh, than uh, the goods on the continent. And so uh, certain regions uh, within France and within uh, uh, Belgium end up uh, being uh, boosted in terms of like their industry because now they didn't have to compete with uh, uh, British goods as much as they had before. Uh, and so they were able to have like a little bit more of a boost. On top of that, uh, Italy, in terms of its agricultural produce, were, you know, that was kind of uh, boosted as well. But 
beyond this, the rest of the continent suffered more from the blockade uh, than uh, than Britain did. And on top of that, as we said before, you know, the the kind of allies of the French were not really genuine allies, right? And the invasion of like Germanic land and of Italian land and Spanish land, etc, etc, by the French end up spurring nationalism, right? So up until this point, nationalism hadn't really been a big force in Europe, right? You know, so nationality uh, was for the most part to do with loyalty to the, uh, the crown of the respective countries, right? So for instance, something like almost half of uh, the uh, uh, officer class within uh, Russia were actually from Germany, right? So it kind of gives you a bit of an idea yeah, that like, you know, most of the uh, people were not necessarily like tied to the actual land itself, right? However, by the invasion of all these lands by the French, this spurred a rise of nationalism, right? So uh, in Spain, you had uh, the people uh, known as guerrillas, right? And this is where we get like the term like guerrilla warfare from. It's from like that campaign in the Peninsular War. Uh, and, you know, this war, you know, tied down a lot of Frenchmen, uh, you know, something like a quarter of a million of them were tied down in fighting these kind of, uh, uh, you know, this, the, this guerrilla campaign in uh, Spain. Uh, and on top of that, you had like a rise of nationalism in in Germany, you know, because obviously uh, Napoleon had destroyed the Holy Roman Empire, it meant that all the different like duchies and, and kingdoms and whatever uh, that were inside of what would later become Germany, before they had no sense of uh, any reason to kind of unify, right? But with the French invasion, the sense of German nationalism really started to rise, right? And out of all these different uh, German kingdoms, Prussia was still the one which had like the largest amount of autonomy out of them, right? So more likely than not, at some point, Prussia would have broken away and you know, they would have probably uh, liberated a, a great deal of like the German states. You know, like the War of the Sixth Coalition has often been referred to in German as the, uh, the War of Liberation. So more likely than not, the Prussians would have been seen as liberators of the other uh, German states. And so who knows, German unification, which we've done a video on, definitely check that out, might have happened even sooner than in our own timeline, right? And then the same can also be said for Italy as well, yeah, you know, like the French occupation of Italy, again, this ended up spurring uh, uh, Italian nationalism. So I think that this system, realistically, I can't see it lasting into, you know, even to like the 1850s and stuff. I think there's so many different competing nationalisms and France having to pull its resources in so many different directions, I don't really see it lasting. Never mind the fact that obviously, uh, you know, Spain's possessions in the New World end up being you know, it would have been very difficult for them to have held that down because, you know, by France invading Spain and by making the Portuguese monarchy have to flee to Brazil, this destabilized things in Latin America. So the Spanish and Portuguese empires were very like top down uh, kind of things, right? Where, where they were directly controlled either from Madrid or uh, Lisbon respectively. And so unlike in other colonial settings where there was a greater deal of local autonomy, in these places, everything was you know very much centered yeah in like the the, the far distant capital. You know, so by the invasion of uh, Spain and Portugal by Napoleon, this led to a great deal of instability in Latin America. So even after you know Napoleon was finally defeated, yeah, it meant that you know the Latin American countries end up rising up, uh, and you know Brazil because it had been used to you know being uh, run as well without um, Portuguese control, it also got its independence as well. So between 1816 and 18 22, nearly all the countries in Latin America end up gaining their independence. So France obviously had a, a bit, great deal of interest in Latin America. Uh, later on, you'd have uh, you know, the Emperor of Mexico uh, being propped up uh, by uh, Napoleon III, as we discussed in one of our previous videos as well. Uh, so France would have got involved in that. However, over time, as America got stronger, you know, the Monroe Doctrine would have like, it would have kind of clashed with uh, the French and over time they would have really exhausted themselves yeah if they were struggling to keep Europe together they certainly would have been uh, struggling to keep the Spanish Empire together and then finally of course we have to talk about the impact that the war had on Russia right so Russia up until this point hadn't really had a great sense of itself in terms of uh, nationalism as I said like kind of like you know loyalty to, to the Tsar was what defined you as being a Russian but because of this war it had a huge impact on Russian culture, right? So from, you know, Tolstoy's uh, War and Peace, uh, uh, basically documenting the entire war, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, later in the century, you had uh, a Tchaikovsky doing his uh, famous uh, 1812 overture. And then on top of that, you had uh, Pushkin, uh, you know, who's like known as like the, the father of Russian literature. Uh, he was, you know, he done a great poem uh, on Napoleon. It's very long, but, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the link in the description for it, uh, you know, definitely uh, check it out because it's really, really good. Um, and yeah, obviously it's translated into English, so don't worry about it, right? But it had a huge, huge impact on Russia. And many uh, different cathedrals and many monuments were, were, were built in a commemoration for uh, the, the so-called Patriotic War. And remember that title of the Patriotic War because this echoes down the century, right? So later, when uh, the Germans invade in 1941, that war, World War II, ends up being known in Russian as the Great Patriotic War. So the legacy of the invasion by Napoleon ends up stretching all the way down into the 20th century with the German invasion of the Soviet Union, right? So it was a massive inspiration for, for, the, for the Russians and it was a massive uh, uh, boost to the sense of Russian nationalism. So Russia ended up being propelled as being a great nation uh, within uh, the, the European uh, set of nations and it was all because of this invasion. So Russia might otherwise have been kind of kept outside of Europe and it always kind of been seen as like an outsider. This invasion sprung it into uh, uh, the, the, the affairs of Europe, yeah, like full stage, right? And even Russian troops in 1814 end up marching through the streets of Paris as a final kind of uh, triumphant uh, declaration of victory against the French for what they had done to their own country. And so, Thank you. And uh, if you like that video, don't forget to hit the like button. As we said in previous videos, uh, we've got merchandise now. Uh, so definitely check that out as well. Uh, check us out on Instagram and let us know like kind of like what things you'd be interested in uh, in potentially buying and stuff. So we've got a whole range of different uh, goods and stuff which we're kind of coming through. Uh, and then also as well, we're giving you guys uh, the, the choice between two different videos, right? Right, so one video is going to be about uh, what if Afghanistan had peace. So we're going to be looking at, you know, the time pre the Soviet invasion and stuff. Yeah, so we're going back to the 1970s in uh, Afghanistan and looking at one specific event and what would happen if that hadn't happened and how Afghanistan today might be living in peace and prosperity, etc, etc. Or I can do a more personal video, which is why I left the Conservative Party. So a lot of people might be shocked to know that I used to be a Conservative Party member and also used to be a Labour Party member as well. But that's, a, that's just a longer conversation, right? But I think that, you know, there, there's been lots of things happened uh, more recently, uh, which have really ground my gears and I just want to kind of do a video on that at some point but I'm going to give you guys a choice of what the video for next week is going to be do you want the Afghan one or do you want the one about me leaving the Conservative Party so let me know in the comment section or hit me up on Instagram and uh, tell me what which one you prefer and with that being said have a great day and bye